but I was just like, I want to accomplish this goal and this dream and I want to make it, I want to make this much money. And then when it happened, it still wasn't feeling like, where's the feeling I'm supposed to have? Mm -hmm. And once I started to look back and say, okay, I've done a bunch of stuff, but I still don't feel fulfilled. That's when I said, I got to start making everything else, else about how can I impact the people around me the best way possible? Mm -hmm. How can I lift them up and elevate them? It's one of the reasons why I started the School of Greatness because I was like, I want to shine a light on everyone else and not make it about me originally and just lift others up and create a platform for those. And that helped me let go of the ego a lot of just being successful for me. I still want to be successful. Right. But I think- You've probably also figured out that being successful is a product of what you do for others. 100%. Yeah. 100%. Impacting the people around you mm -hmm. and adding as much value as possible, which you guys do at first form. It's beautiful. Um, but what I realized was that self-doubt was the biggest killer of my dreams. The insecurities, the doubt, the fears that held me back. Mm -hmm. And I started to dissect, you know, over the last 10 years, kind of what these, and ask all these great people that I've interviewed, you've interviewed a lot of them, you know a lot of them as well, about how they overcame self-doubt and the fears that held them back the most. And I realized that there were three main fears that causes anyone to doubt themselves. The first one is the fear of failure, which as an athlete, I don't know if you ever had the fear of failure. I didn't because I knew as an athlete like I was going to fail my way to success. Mm -hmm. That was the process. You miss a shot, you just like realign it, you keep shooting, right? Yeah, I was so the I, same. Yeah, so I wasn't like, I'm afraid to fail, so I'm not going to even attempt the shot. I would shoot and fail and okay, I'm going to learn and grow. So fear of failure was not a, a, a thing for me, but if you ask a bunch of people listening and you guys DM Andy and say, have you ever been afraid to fail? I bet a lot of people will say, yes, I've been afraid to fail. And it's why they don't start the show or launch the book or do it or start the company or whatever it is. They don't go for the girl, whatever it might be, they're afraid of failure. The second fear is the fear of success. I didn't understand this growing up either because I wanted to be successful, right? Yeah, you never this, this is one I never got either. Exactly. Yeah. But when I go and speak in rooms and I ask people who here has ever been afraid of success, I'm shocked more than half the room raises their hand. I, I never understood it. It confuses me. Never understood Because I get the same thing, dude. Here's the thing though. I started, when I started to ask questions about it, I realized that there's a weight to gold. There's a massive responsibility you have being the leader of this company, being a leader of yeah. 400 plus employees, being a leader of yeah. hundreds of thousands or millions of customers and living a life that people can model and be inspired by. There's a weight to gold. And there's an amazing documentary called Weight of Gold that is about Olympic gold medalists who get depressed after they win the gold medal, get suicidal, commit suicide, overdose, and all these things because they, they don't know how to handle success. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, but there's a, a series that talks about the ones that do. And as I started to make money and I started to become more successful, it's funny because when I left St. Louis and went to go pursue my dreams, I had tight friends from high school and college. For whatever reason, they stopped calling me back. Mm -hmm when I went to go pursue things that they could have done as well, but they didn't. And I didn't get it. I was really hurt by that. And then years later, I would start to get phone calls once they saw me successful in business and making money and then asking for things. I'm so proud of you, bro. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. I knew it. you could but do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. but, I, but, I, the, yeah. Thing, but the thing is there, I understood when, when you leave a tribe, your family, your tribe, to go pursue something, and if they don't believe in you, and they kind of push you away or they stop responding to you, you don't, it doesn't feel good. It feels lonely. Yeah. And you want to go back to that friend group, the family group, the people that, you know, supported you once. It's scary. And it's also scary to figure out like, do people truly like me for me or because I have this platform or because I have the money or because of whatever now. And so I understood as I started interviewing people and kind of experiencing it the fear of success, but it, again, it wasn't something holding me back from at least putting myself out there. I would still try and launch the thing I wanted to do. But the third fear is the fear that crippled me for most of my life. And I think that holds a lot of people back too, which is the fear of judgment, the opinions of other people. Again, I could, I could try anything and fail and be okay. I wasn't afraid to at least attempt. I wanted success, so I was going after it. But it was all the criticism and judgment behind my back, publicly online, comments that would just kill me. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I had to defend myself every time there was an attack, a judgment. Because at the core of all three of these fears, failure, success, and judgment, the center is I'm not enough. 
somewhere I believe that I am not enough, not good enough, smart enough, talented enough, worthy enough, whatever it might be. And that was definitely my biggest insecurity was I'm not enough in so many ways. And so I needed people to give me the approval. I needed people to accept me because I didn't accept me fully. Now, I accept myself fully now. It doesn't mean I'm still not hungry. It doesn't mean I'm still not a work in progress. It doesn't mean I'm still not driven to create re results in my life and make an impact and do all these beautiful things. But I finally come to myself after literally 10 years of different healing modalities and processes and making big mistakes and learning and growing, I finally feel at peace with accepting myself. And from that space, I feel like I can do anything, no matter if people talk crap about me. It doesn't mean I have to like it, but I can still do it and not be afraid of that. And that's really at the core of the greatness mindset is identifying which fear holds you back because I believe self-doubt is the killer of dreams. If we doubt ourselves, it's just going to hold us back. Or if we accomplish, it'll never be enough. Yeah. And so we must learn how to accept and love ourselves. I'm, I know that's maybe not the talk you would have here about acceptance and loving yourself, but I truly feel like it's learning to see yourself truly for who you are, all your flaws and insecurities, all your shame, all your past, get to a place of meaning about everything that's happened to you to accept yourself now so that you can lean forward in your life in alignment with your best self. And that's what it's about. Yeah, dude, I, I think, first of all, I agree with everything you're saying 100%. And what you just said about this might not be the thing here, right. okay? The, the reason that I do not really address that is because I believe that in a lot of people, it's become a toxic mentality. 100%. Where they are not, it's like when I talk about luck. They're not, dis they're not disciplined. No, yeah. at all. And, and so they're accepting who they are yeah. with zero effort to try and become the best version of 100%. themselves. Yeah. Yep. And so when I talk about luck, bro, like the minute I t mention luck, okay, because we talk about success, personal development, you know, when I go speak, the minute luck comes up, 50% of the room shuts the f down because mm. they're like, dude, see, mm -hmm. he got lucky. I didn't get lucky. And so they use it as a thing. It's the cop out. Yes. And so the reason I'm so hard on the self-love space, because I am hard on it, because I believe it, belie I believe it means something else than what most people believe that it means. I agree. I believe that it means you should recognize the potential in yourself and love yourself enough to make the changes that produce the best possible version of yourself. Amen. It doesn't mean accept yourself and all your flaws and do nothing about them and continue to be a piece of And be lazy. Right, yeah, yeah. exactly. And so yeah. like, I feel like it's gotten toxic. So the reason that I, I hammer on it, and it does get misunderstood a lot. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people hear me talk and they're like, this guy's a psychopath. That, that may be <laughs> yeah. true. No <laughs> meditating, guys. Yeah. You fuck yeah. out of here. <laughs> it may be true. You might be right. But it's not that I don't believe in these things. It's yeah. just I believe they're misunderstood. Yeah. You know, and I believe that there's, you know, like for example, like when we talk about uh, you know, the body positivity movement, yeah. you know, it's it's you should feel good about how you look if you're doing the things that are to improve what your health exactly. is supposed to be. You're in alignment. Yes. And your actions are in alignment with your greatest self. Yeah, your never, none self. of us are perfect, bro. Exactly. Be honest with yourself. Like, are you really happy with how right. you look? If you not, know what you're I'm saying? probably not making the actions you need to do. Yeah. You're not being your word. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask this, uh, Lewis, because the thing, like, we talk, like, Andy talks about it quite a bit. You know, the work comes before the belief, mm -hmm. right? So, I, like, do you, would you agree that a lot of people that have these issues of the self doubt, is because they have not put the work in to have the belief in themselves that they can accomplish whatever yeah. it is. I mean, like yours, it took you 10 years, right? Like you got yeah. to, but well, now those you, fears that he's talking about too, bro, those are paralyzing fears. They, they, the, you're right. Yeah. But what these three fears that we're talking about here, mm -hmm. these are things that create an action by the nature mm -hmm. of the fear. By yeah. default, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so addressing these fears up front and especially hearing, you know, I think most people, should hear that like even somebody like me or somebody who's you're looking at, we struggle with those three things yeah. absolutely yeah now do i understand the fear of success not really but as i've gotten more successful it has become more of a of a weight there's like, a pressure yeah responsibility and that's a real weight. yeah it's, that's a real thing it doesn't get easier nobody prepares you for that it doesn't get easier the more successful no you it gets much harder 
you have if you're if you're an ethical human you, it gets easier in terms of you can take care of financial things easier but it doesn't make your emotions easier managing people easier understanding people's intentions easier dealing with uh, more conflict dealing with whatever people are saying about you like the weight of it is big and i yeah. think a lot of people don't want that weight they don't mm -hmm. want the responsibility and they don't actually know how hard it is to be in your position dude i never thought about that weight like oh. like like on my journey you know it's 24 years now i've been in business i never thought i never stopped to think about it like of all the fears that you mentioned i struggle with the third one as well judgment yeah yeah um it's usually because we judge ourselves so much yeah well what it is is that we know our own weaknesses yeah. we know the shit that we're not great at mm -hmm. and then when someone else happens to point it out we feel like oh my god we've been exposed i know and it's like <laughs> dude everybody knows this yeah. you know what i'm saying like everybody's the same and mm -hmm. um but I never thought about the, the, the weight, you know, but that's a real thing. Huge it's, thing. It's a massive thing. And people don't, you know, nobody prepares you for that. Like nobody mm -hmm. talks about how much pressure you feel. If you are a decent human mm -hmm. running a massive company where you're responsible for hundreds and thousands of people. And, and so many, no, not every person is going to understand your intentions. And yeah. they may be upset for a multitude of things that yeah. was not your intention. And mm -hmm. there's really nothing you can do about it except no. just take it on the chin. It's part, it's, it's part of being great. It's it. Part of being great is you have to be willing to be misunderstood. 100%. And accept that it's going to be lonely. Mm -hmm. And you might only have a, a, a core group of people who truly see you and fully acknowledge what you're up to and accept you for who you are, where everyone else might be judging you, complaining, gossiping behind your back. No matter how loving and caring you are, it may just not be the case. And to go back to what you were saying, um, I'm 100% I'm in agreement that it's the consistent actions of doing the hard things or just the things you say you're going to commit to mm -hmm. and completing those things, which build the confidence and the belief in yourself. It's hard to believe yourself when you do nothing. Like no. you said, you can't be lazy and say, I believe in myself because you're not getting any results. And it's really not even about the results. It's about the consistency of the effort mm -hmm. and saying, I'm going to do this every day for seven days. And you did it. Great. Now you can have some, even if you didn't accomplish what you set out to do, which is I'm going to lose five pounds in two weeks, even if you didn't do it, but you did exactly what you're supposed to do on 75 hard and you did it to the, the program, that is something to build confidence in. One of the things I talk about in the book is I, w I had so many insecurities and fears uh, after I was done playing arena football, which again, I was only making 250 bucks a week uh, back playing arena football. So it wasn't like I was some huge stud in the NFL. But for me, it was a dream. It was a dream to like get a, a little check and catch a football. I was like, this is yeah. unbelievable, yeah. right? It was amazing. And I probably would have done it for free, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because I was like, this is just unbelievable. Um, but after that, I went through a period of, I had a surgery and went through a period of just like kind of who am I, what's my identity, you know, and what's happening in the world in 2008 to 2009 and 10. I was trying to figure things out. And I was afraid, I realized I was acting like I was confident, but I was really afraid inside with so many things. And I had a mentor who said, I want you to make a list of all your fears. And he said, create a fear list. And what I want you to do is start knocking it off one by one. Start with the biggest fear first. And public speaking was a big one. I couldn't stand in front of a, a classroom without stuttering and kind of trembling and just feeling very insecure because I had a, a very low reading level and a communication level in, in middle school and high school. That's amazing to hear, honestly. I was like thinking about, because like, dude, honestly, real talk, I think you do one of the best interviewers on the planet. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. But in eighth grade, when I came to St. Louis in eighth grade, boarding school, Principia High, they tested me for all the standardized tests, I had a second grade reading level. So from eighth grade all the way through seven years of college, I had a tutor during lunch. I was in special needs classes. And really in my senior year at high school, um, the English teacher was like, Lewis, if you, you're failing right now, if you don't pass, you cannot graduate high school English. You can't go play college football. And so she would help me after class every day to just get to a passing grade just because it was very challenging for me. So I had this insecurity because I felt like everyone else around me was just way smarter. And based on evidence and results on the grade cards that we had, they ranked us. I don't know if they did that at your they, school. Yes, oh, yeah. They did. Yeah. So I was always in the bottom four. Me too. So I was always just like, okay, I'm the dumbest person here and probably in the world. That was the belief that I built based on the evidence and the results I was getting. And I was working hard. I was trying to study. It wasn't like I wasn't giving effort, but it was just didn't understand it. 
And so he said, I want you to create a fear list. Public speaking was a big one because I have that insecurity. And so what I did is I met someone who was a public um, you know, professional speaker who got paid to speak. And he said, you need to go to Toastmasters. And if you really want to overcome your fear, you've got to do it every week. You can't just go once a month or once in a while. You've got to do it every week for a year and act like it's a sport, like you're training for the championship. What, what's Toastmaster real quick? Toastmasters is a, an international association that teaches public speaking. Gotcha. It's, they give like workshops and classes uh, from basic speaking to advanced, and they teach you how to communicate effectively. Um, and they give you like different prompts. So you do 10 speeches to finish like your first course, um, 10 kind of main speeches. But I would go every week and I would present something for at least a two minute speech. But sometimes it was longer. And the first time I got, uh, so I was like, okay, I knew I had a vision or a dream to want to impact people one day. I didn't know if it was going to be me working in, a, in an office or me as a coach. I had no idea, but I knew I needed to be able to communicate effectively and confidently to do anything in my life. Dude, I just covered this on the freaking last show that we really? recorded. Yeah, what you're talking about, how important this is. Yeah. And so he said, I want you to go every week. And so I committed to it like it was a, I was training for a sport. And I went every week. And the first week, I remember I had to give a speech, um, my first speech. It was after a few weeks of going. But my first speech, you're supposed to give a five-minute speech. And they call it the, the icebreaker. It's like, tell us a little bit about who you are. And you have five minutes. It took me weeks to figure out how am I going to speak for five minutes? No joke. This is what, 15 years ago. It took me weeks to think about how do I have an interesting story? Like, is people going to be interested in this? I have no clue what to say. All you got to do is speak for five minutes. And I was terrified. I wrote down word for word the speech and I practiced it for weeks. And when I gave my first presentation, I stood behind a podium in front of 20 people and word for word looked down and read the whole speech. I did not look up one time. I was terrified to look at people, to see them laughing at me, judging me, you know, kind of just giving me awkward stares. So I couldn't look people in the eyes. It was terrifying. And I remember after the, you get feedback after every speech you give. So it's a safe environment, but I was still terrified of the judgment, right? Of what people were going to say, even though they're supposed to lift you up. Mm -hmm. I was terrified. And they give you feedback. And, and I remember I was like, okay. I got the hardest part done. This is the most embarrassed I've ever felt. These are all professional speakers. They gave me feedback. It's a safe environment, but I still feel humiliated, you know, sweating out of my pits, just like horrible feeling. And I was like, okay, I got to train this like a sport. Every week I went back and I, and I couldn't wait to go back. I was like, okay, I'm going to improve on this. I'm going to get more feedback. And I got a coach from there. And I was just like meeting with my coach every week. Teach me how to do this. By the end of the year, I got a standing ovation. I, I didn't need any notes. I didn't need anything. But it was that, that consistency of diving into the thing that I was most afraid of every single week till the end of the year, you know, being able to do it with confidence and poise and being able to remember my points without having to read them down and just being able to implement all the things I learned in a year. That has made me so much money going all in on my fear. And I talk about in the greatness mindset, it's, it's, it's really, Figuring out the talents and the skills and the things that make you feel powerful and leaning into those things, which you've done so well, but also in this fear list, it's figuring out where you feel um, the most insignificance and also the most powerless. And mm -hmm. this was an area that I felt powerless. But after this process of doing what you said, which was taking action consistently to build up your belief. I felt like it was a superpower. I felt mm -hmm. like, okay, now this is a superpower. Something I thought I would never be able to do that made me feel powerless is now a superpower. I'm putting this in my tool belt as a confidence tool that I have now. Let me go down the list of fears and check off the next one. Let me go take it on like a sport, the next fear and the next one and the next one. And by doing that, that's how you build belief. But you turn your fear list into something that is really supporting you for the rest of your life by going all in on it. So that's what, I, that's what I did. And that's what a lot of the greats do. They figure out what is their biggest fear and insecurity and they attack it. They don't hesitate, they attack. Dude, I failed my college public speaking course. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like I'm one of the highest paid speakers on the- I know, look at you now, man. Yeah. You turned it into an asset. Yeah, it's the same thing you're talking it's about. It's amazing. Yeah, like I used to get nervous standing in front of my- 
eight employees at, over on Manchester Road at really? a supplement store. Really? And I would, the same thing, dude. I'd have to read it. Oh, man. People don't understand that. Like, you have to go through that process. Like, Pain. everybody you look at, everybody you admire, everybody you want to emulate or be like or who inspires you, they've all been you before. Yes. All of them. And I think if people would just take a minute to, to remind themselves of that, you know, nobody comes out of the womb an amazing public speaker or an amazing entrepreneur or an amazing, you know, uh, humanitarian or philanthropist or organizer or whatever it is that you do. Nobody comes out that way. The first time they try it, they get punched in the face, yeah. man. Multiple you, times. Yeah, right. <laughs> and it keeps happening. Yeah. And the, the real key is that perseverance, man. And every single time, if you're willing to just learn the lesson and put it in your tool belt, like, yeah. you like I like to say that too, uh, it becomes an asset, man. Huge asset. Yeah. And, and you kept doing it. You, you know, you turned that fear of like speaking to eight people and you just kept trying and practicing and trying new stuff and some things didn't work and they didn't listen to you. And then you figured Bro, out the you next know thing. what? Sometimes I go out there now and I suck. Right. It's, it's exactly. reality. You know what I'm saying? Like, it is what it is. I, I just accept that that's part of the deal. You know, like you, you don't get to, you could be a hall of fame baseball player yeah. and hit the ball, you know, three times out of 10. Exactly. You know, I mean, that's kind of how I look at it. It's just the numbers. Like mm -hmm. nobody's perfect all the time. Nobody's great all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but people will remember you for your greatness when they get to witness it. Absolutely. And I think that's something that, you know, people have to understand. Like no matter how good you get, you're still going to have days that mm -hmm. are bad. Absolutely. Absolutely. Another tool that I learned, because after, so I started making money as a speaker after this, which I never thought would happen. I was like, who would ever pay me? You know, what do I have to offer on a stage? I started making money for years. And then I started speaking on even bigger stages, you know, five, 10,000 people, whatever, like you. And I, I was like, okay, I'm, I know how to speak. I've been speaking for years now. I've been doing it over and over again, you know, probably two speeches a month for years, but I was still getting nervous before my speeches. And I don't know if you, this happens for you, but I, this happened about five years ago when I was like, I'm sick and tired of being nervous. After 10 years of doing this, why am I still a little bit insecure before I go on stage? You always hear people say, well, nerves is a good thing because it makes you prepared. It makes you focused. Yes, but I was insecure and I didn't know why that was happening. And I called a coach of mine probably 30 minutes before a big speech. And I go, I don't know why I'm nervous and why I'm kind of like still insecure and worried. And he said, Lewis, you care so much about how you look. You're focused on saying the joke the right way. You're focused on the opening line. You're focused on this. And you just need to focus on service. You need to know and own that you will forget something you want to say. You're going to forget that funny joke or the timing's going to be off. You need to know it and own it and be okay with it. Like go into it knowing this is not going to be a perfect speech and I accept that it won't be. I accept that it won't be. I'm prepared the best I can to give the best I can, but I know I can always do better and it's okay. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show up. I'm going to serve the audience and give them what they need. Not get what I need out of this, give them what they need. And it shifted everything for me with a lot of things. My podcast, when I had a big guest on, I'd be nervous. And I just said, I'm here to serve the audience and I'm not going to be perfect. It's your intent. It's my intention is to serve people yes. the best way I can. And I'm going to stutter and I'm going to forget something. And I'm going to say something stupid and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And when I started to do that, I actually relaxed a lot more and performed better because I wasn't thinking about me. You were nervous and it wasn't your flow it was it wasn't about being successful it was about service which is greatness right. and you actually achieve more when you lean into service and so that's just another tool for people if you feel insecure or nervous stop thinking about me and start thinking about how can you give dude what you just described it's so cool that you described it that way because the same exact process happened for me you said you don't know if i get nervous i did used to get nervous but i do not get nervous at all anymore mm -hmm. ever mm -hmm. ever in, for really anything and the reason I don't, and Ed Milet's the one that pointed this out uh, to me. He's great. He's the best. He's my best friend, dude. He's the only guy I can truly talk to who I know will actually not judge. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. At this point in time. Yeah. <clears throat> He's not going to run away and say, oh, Andy told me this. Yeah. Like, I could be real with him. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, but he, he pointed this out. And he's like, look, man. He's like, if you want to drop the nerves, He's like, just remember that you're there. Your intent is for them to get better. Uh -huh. And if, if you approach everything, whether it be a speech or whether it be a podcast or whether it be your business plan or whether it be a conversation or a relationship and your intent is always in the right spot, 
you don't have anything to be nervous mm-hmm. about. Yeah. And people pick up on it. The energy that people pick up once I actually came to the understanding that this is what the key was, the energy that the people pick up is much better. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's, it's like you said, it's lighter. You know much what I'm lighter. saying? So I'm not up there. You know, when I go up and speak, you know, I'm not I, stressed or anything. Bro, like I don't yet. even prepare anymore. Yeah. I speak from the heart. It's a beautiful. So way. when I go up there, I'm now if I'm teaching an arte or something, I might use slides to yeah. make points. But for the most part, if I'm giving a speech, dude, you're hearing what's on my heart that day That's at amazing. that time. That's amazing. Yeah. My friend Rory Vaden said to me one time, it's hard to be nervous when your heart's on service. Yes. Man, it's really great. it's hard to be nervous when your heart's on service. Yeah. And I think it's so true. It's just like when you're when your heart's thinking about yourself looking good, you're probably going to be more nervous. Mm-hmm. But when we're just focused out and just thinking, how can I give, knowing it's not going to be the perfect thing, but it's going to be exactly what people need right now, that's when it's magic. Yeah. That, that, that piece of advice really, really made a difference for me mm-hmm. like in a lot of different areas. When did Ed tell you that? Well, uh, it's been a couple of years. Yeah. You know, it's been a couple of years. I mean, I was already great at speaking and doing, uh-huh. you know, all these things, but, you know, my point is to always get better mm-hmm. and improve. And, you know, Ed and I, our conversations, you know, they're very much so like very honest with each other yeah. about how we can improve each other. Yes. And that was just something that he pointed out. Um, in one of the many conversations that we've had that just stuck with me mm-hmm. and you just described the whole process. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. He respects you so much. I was just with him yesterday and he's just like amazed at who you are, who you've become as a human and what you're building. A in lot society. of that has to do with my friendship with him. Yeah. I mean, he's been man. a great, you know, cause he's a little bit older than me. Mm-hmm. He's got more life experience and he's been great at subtly directing me yeah. in, in a, in a, in a healthy, you know, productive way yeah you know he's never been someone that's been like andy you're too much or andy you're this mm-hmm. or that it's always been you know hey have you ever thought about this have you ever thought about that and those things you know for me that's the best way to communicate with me yeah right because like when people tell me what to do i fuck i'm like fuck you. <laughs> you're like get <laughs> yeah. out of my face <laughs> yeah i'm curious how old are you now 43 43 yeah if you could go back to 33 and, and think about where you were in that time and where the company was, where you were personally, your health, your relationships, intimate and friendships, family, career stuff. And you could think about where you were then. What advice would you give your 33-year-old self from what you know now? Like what's the number one thing you would say to support you and just having a little bit more, you know, fulfillment or peace or getting here faster or, you know, not beating yourself as much up. What would you say to yourself then? I would have sat myself down and had to talk about my own discipline and what it meant to be disciplined in all areas. Cause you weren't as disciplined. No, I was at that time at 33, I was 330 pounds. You know, I, I, a lot of, I was drinking all the time, partying all the time. I thought it was cool to be the wild guy, you know, and you know what I'm saying? Wild man. Yeah. yeah. And that's how I, that, I was always that way growing up. And, um, you know, I wish I would have had someone that sat me down and said, Hey bro, you know, that's not as cool as you f- think it is. You know what I'm saying? And you're very undisciplined and you're emotionally undisciplined. And if you could develop this discipline now, you will get much further ahead at a much faster rate. Yeah. And I think that's the advice that I would have focused on there because I didn't really figure that out until I was about 36 years old, mm. right? And at that time, I was 350 pounds. I, yeah. I was big, dude. And you remember. I remember, man. Yeah. Yeah, I was, yeah. couldn't put my arms around yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, once I started figuring that out, man, everything accelerated. Yeah. I mean, and it's undeniable. I mean, it's all areas of my life. Uh-huh. Everything's gotten much better, uh, not just from a, you know, success standpoint, but from a, yeah. a happiness standpoint, a fulfillment standpoint, and a, and a um, a feeling of gratitude standpoint. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Everything got better yeah. when I when my discipline when I learned how to be disciplined. Mm-hmm. And the thing that you know people should understand is that discipline is not just about your body. Like we we talk about it in 75 hard and live hard, and it focuses heavily on your physical. But the truth is, is that Discipline, once you learn it, can be applied to all areas. And so that's the thing that I wish I would have understood at a younger age, that had I had the skills to not only be disciplined in in a physical, Mm -hmm. now, you know, I struggle with my physique. Like, it wasn't like I had never been in shape before. I had just become undisciplined. Right. And, you know, I think if, if I had understood at 33 what that could actually do for me, 
I would have bought it hook, line, and sinker nah. and dedicated my entire life to and it. And gone all in on it. Yeah, for sure. Because, dude, the, the amount of progress that has happened in my life in all areas from the time I started figuring that out to now is like I did like 20 years worth of, uh, I got 20 years worth of results in like four and a half years. Amazing. You know what I'm saying? And so that's the impact of taking true control over your existence mm. is that it greatly accelerates everything else. I'm curious then in that, that discipline phase over the last 10 years, what is the one, the one thing you change about your thinking sooner and the one thing you would change about your emotions sooner since we are a product of our thoughts and yeah. our feelings, you know, our, as Dr. Joe Dispenza says, our, our, our personality becomes our personal reality. Mm -hmm. So your thoughts, what would you have changed about how you think about yourself? You think about other people, the world, life, you know, what would you have changed differently about your thinking and then also your feelings? Well, in regards to feelings, I was on Lexapro for 11 years, wow. okay? And there was just a study that came out that showed that Lexapro not only keeps you from being depressed, but it also keeps you from feeling anything, all right? right. And so when I got off of it, which was last year, uh, which was really, really hard to do, uh, I started feeling things again. And I started, like, it was weird, dude, because, like, you, you know me. Like, I'm not known as a most, like, emotional type yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like I would have these situations where I would just break down. Like, mm -hmm. and it wasn't that these situations were overly emotional. It's just I hadn't felt any emotions in so long that it hit me really hard. Sure. Things were hitting me hard. And um, I wish I had understood what that medication was doing to me. And I would have looked into it further than just following those, the doctors telling me, Taylor, take this pill. Mm -hmm. Because the truth of the matter is, is had I become disciplined and had I controlled the things I control, had I done those things, I wouldn't have needed that. Yeah. You know, and um, so that's, that's, that's a regret of mine, but it's also a massive learning lesson. And I try to talk about it because mm -hmm. I want other people to, to, mm -hmm. to come to that realization. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, to answer your question, man, you know, I, I subscribe to the feeling, and I know this is, this is not a cop out, but this is how I truly feel. I truly feel that everything happened the way that it should sure. because it's led me to this point. Mm -hmm. And I feel like now, you know, I do, I feel like, like if I'm comparing the two versions of myself, I was definitely more aggressive in terms of like, I mean, you remember my old videos where I'm mm -hmm. going crazy, like, <laughs> right. but, that, but that's to made my brand. Right. It was, so it's it was like, cool hard, too, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's hard to like, yeah. It still comes out. It still comes yeah, out when yeah, I get yeah. real passionate, but I wish I had done a better job of controlling that part of me because that part came out too often mm -hmm. and it came out in, in situations where it wasn't appropriate. For example, like, you know, there's people who I would have a meeting with, right? And like, what would end up happening is, is like they would be afraid that that was going to come out. So I didn't get anything good from anybody. Right. Right. So I sabotaged them. And now here I am years later and I like, I'm realizing and I'm like, that wasn't good. Right. You know what I'm saying? And so there's and some, still look what you created. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you know, uh, it's hard, it's hard, man, because mm -hmm. I, I feel very fortunate to be where we are. Yeah. And so it's hard to really criticize the past, mm -hmm. but I can tell you this for sure. I was thinking about this just earlier today. You know, had I had like, like, let's just say me now could talk to me then in the beginning, like back when I first started in 1999, I could have saved myself probably two thirds of the success journey that mm -hmm. I was on just from the shit that I know now that I didn't know then. But more importantly, I could have saved myself tons of mental agony because I could have reassured that, hey, look, this is just the way it goes. Yeah. And this is, just, this is just part of the deal. And you signed up for this. And nobody ever tells you those things. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like when you're getting your face beat in in business, <laughs> right? Like it's nobody comes along and says, hey, it's going to be okay. Yeah, like, yeah. You don't feel like it's going to be okay. You feel like your world's ending. I know. And, uh, you know, for a lot of people, you know, going back to that third fear that you mentioned, that's almost like the deal breaker. You know, the minute that their friends or their family or someone that they thought was their friend 
says one thing about their they're doing oh, like man. it's the end like i remember when i first started uh posting because how I, how my brand got started was i i was on facebook mm -hmm. i didn't know what to talk about bro and so what was interesting to me was success mm -hmm. and so i just started talking about things that i understood that you need to do like making yeah. little motivational quotes yep. and things you know and dude real talk like I could understand why people thought it was ridiculous. Uh -huh. Like looking back, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I was broke. I was a struggling business owner. We weren't very successful. I was not in great shape. So like I get why people would question it. But I remember posting a couple times in the very beginning and, you know, people that were in my family, like people that were related to me, getting in the comment section and being like, who, like, I remember, like, I know the exact person and I'm not going to say his name. You know, the day and time you saw yeah, it. I do. Yeah. And I never forget it. That's problem. That's a problem for me. Cause I have mm. basically a photographic memory. Wow. I can remember anything. Like wow. if I read your book, I can recite it to you. Wow. So that's a, that's a gift. It's a, it is a gift, but it's not a gift when it comes to shit like that. Right. Because I remember every <laughs> single thing, every yeah. single thing that anybody ever said wrong to me, I remember it forever. Wow. And so this guy who's related to me got in my comment section. He's like, he like laughed and he's like, oh, I guess you think you're Tony Robbins now. And this is somebody that I grew up like looking up to. Okay? You looked up to. Yes. Wow. It was devastating for me. And I got pissed and I went back at him real hard and called him out on all his. But the truth of the matter is, is like, you know, for most people that first time that happens, because that went on to happen a bunch of different times in different ways, mm -hmm. right? The first time that happens, people stop. And they're like, you know what? I'm not Tony Robbins. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I'm not Tony Robbins. There's only one up. Tony yeah. Robbins. Yeah. I'm me. You know? And is it because they're thinking the same inside, like internally? They're thinking the same thoughts, and now they're getting this mm -hmm. external validation of like, well, the thing is, you know what I'm saying? No, no one creating anything meaningful is criticizing someone else. No, you don't that's see. It. You, you don't never see, see a winner hating on a winner, you, and or, you never see negative comments on an Amazon review from other authors. Yeah, no other author is going to go and say this book sucks, mm -hmm. this podcast sucks if they have a podcast. Mm -hmm. They're not going to do that because they know how hard it is to create something, yeah. even if it does. And suck. there's a base level of respect, hundred percent, that you went through the process. Yes, like bro, I've had, I've been asked to have lots of people on my show where their book wasn't that great. Right. So I didn't have him on the show, Yeah, but I also commended him and I said, Hey, this is great that you wrote that book. It's just not the right time. Exactly. And you know, I let them, I don't like hammer them down. Yeah. You're not I let giving them, them continue a negative to grow. Yeah, yeah. And eventually they'll end up sitting over there, uh -huh. you know? Exactly. And, and so dude, you know, we all deal with these things. Like every single person listening to this, like the, the third fear, especially the fear mm -hmm. of judgment is I think, I think that's the fear that paralyzes most people. Yeah. I think it's, I think most people are so afraid. And especially with the prevalence of cancel culture over the last oh, five or six years, people, you Where know, it could end your career for a period of time, yeah, bro. Yeah, it could have listen. You, you and really I have bad. both been through it. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. And and dude, these what ends up happening is, and this is the real damage of cancel culture. Okay, I've been canceled a number of times because I'm opinionated, I'm loud, and some people find me obnoxious. I know you guys all love the f out of me, <laughs> but some people don't. All right, I know it's hard to believe. Piggy's up. <laughs> yeah, but the reality is, is that, you know, every single time that happened, I grew. My brand grew, Dude. my business grew, Man. everything grew. So I learned to not be afraid of just being who I am, but other people see it. Yeah. And here's the damage that cancel culture really creates. They get scared. Yeah. Bro, and it suppresses their potential. I'm not going to say anything. I'm yes. not going to do anything. There's I'm not so, going to put my There's ass. so much good potential sitting on the sidelines of the game of life because they are afraid of the way that society has behaved mm. towards each other for the yeah. last five or six years. And, and dude, that's what I think of when I see people going through it, man, and getting hammered. You know, every single one of my friends who's, a, who, who's really doing anything has been a victim of this culture yeah. at some point in time. And when I see them going through it, dude, the, I'm, I know they're going to be okay because, dude, all of us will take care of each other. And we'll push yeah. each other back to the top. But the reality is, is that there's so many people that watch that you say, Fuck, I don't ever want that to happen to me. Yeah, I don't want yeah, those arrows. Yeah. 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 And so the first time they set out to, you know, write a book or, or do something, own a business. And they get any little criticism. Bro, they're like, like, oh, here it is. <laughs> here it's coming for me. And they stop. <laughs> scary, and dude, man. it keeps it like, I, I truly believe that cancel culture is an intentional um, propaganda idea to, to make people be more, more mediocre. Mm -hmm. it's it's too it's too 
it's no different than political correctness or censorship. Political mm-hmm. correctness, censorship, these are ideas that were created so that people wouldn't speak up. They, it's for you to self-censor yourself, okay? Oh, I don't want to say that because that's offensive. We don't have to say Well, what if it. it's true? Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, so we have all these psychological operations that have been introduced into our culture, and I believe that cancel culture is the most painful one, and I think it's the most intentional one because what it does is it creates a scenario where people are so afraid to even step out and create anything Mm -hmm. that everybody loses. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you guys have to understand, first of all, you shouldn't pile on people that are doing that. And and second of all, you should stand up for them. And third of all, you should remember that even when you hate someone and everybody's piling on them, that that's not a good thing because other people are witnessing it and they're deciding right there and then that they're going to be nothing because of that. Right. Yeah, bro. Yeah, man. I love it. Yeah, it's dangerous. The, the rant. Stuff. I love the rant, man. Well, I, I you know, it's it's <laughs> it goes with that fear of judgment. Hundred percent, man. It hammers it home. And I think that's what a lot of us need to learn how to overcome. And when we again, when we put ourselves in situations where we can totally embarrass ourselves yeah. and realize I'm still alive, I'm okay, <laughs> like everything's yeah. going to be okay, and then do it again and again, we only expand and grow not only physically, and mentally, but spiritually. Because when we cleanse the ego, when we put ourselves through that, and we do get criticized and judged. And we're able to still accept ourselves, our egos get cleansed, and we can just get bigger and grow and serve more people. But that takes a lot of courage. And it, it took it me a it lot does. of courage to try to like manage it. And I've and I've felt the criticism and things like that time to time. And there have been moments where I'm like, maybe I should stop. Maybe I should just pause for a while. Yeah. And luckily I reached out to some good mentors and were like, this is all gonna pass, you know. Yeah. That's the point. And, and, they and, want and you to stop. Exactly. They yeah. want you. And my my fear was like, maybe I should stop. Yeah. Maybe I should stop posting on social media. Maybe yeah. I should stop my podcast. Maybe I shouldn't do another book because this doesn't feel good. It does not feel good to be attacked. I can no. tell you that. Um, but when you learn that this is going to happen no matter what, you're going to be criticized whether you're on your sister's couch and you're going to be criticized whether you are got the business that you got, the yeah. size you have. Yeah. Either way, people are going to discount you and criticize you. So you might as well do something you enjoy and love. If you're going to get judged. Yeah. You know? And you better, be, you'd rather be criticized with a few bucks in your pocket. Exactly. Than that. <laughs> I'm not saying. Is that, do you guys think that's also stems too from the, the idea that people want, like, I want a hundred percent of everybody to love me. I don't think so anyone doesn't get, want people to love them except yeah. for maybe Andy. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, dude, no, he's right. Like there, there's a, I think there's a big thing to that. I think a lot of people can't understand the basic concept that not everybody is for you and not they're not going to be. Right. And you can't please people. No, no matter what you do, they are not going to like you. And if you, if you bend yourself oh, man. To, to trying to appease everybody, you lose yourself completely. That was me for a long time. Bro, it's a lot of people. Giving in to it's please others, people. giving in yeah. to make people you like me. You have to be willing to say, yeah. hey man, it is what it is. Yeah. You know, and, and that's the truth. And this is what I talk about all the time. You know, you guys in business, like you guys are trying to build a personal brand you, you should just accept today that 50% of the population is not going to resonate with you. And in fact, they're going to have a propensity to not like you. So like when you get on your story and you start talking, they're going to say, well, f- this guy, that's what the f- those 50% mm-hmm. are going to do. You are far better off creating content and being who you are for the people, the 50% that are mm-hmm. going to listen and they are going to have a propensity to like you and then doing yourself in such a great way that they, these people end up loving you. Yeah. And that's really the game. The game mm-hmm. isn't you're going to get everybody to love you, dude. Right. It's, it's impossible. But I will tell you this. It still f- hurts when people don't. Uh-huh. And that's what, people, that's what people don't realize. Like you have, to, you have to let it hurt a little bit and then be like, well, f- those people. And then yeah. just move on to <laughs> right, right. right. Yeah. And I think it's beautiful what you guys have done here at First Form and also your show is you are unapologetic of your identity and who you are and what you stand for. And it's one of the reasons why it's grown so big. And there's going to be, there's a hundred percent going to be some people that will never follow, never listen, never buy. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. But it's going to expand you into more of the people that do relate, that do love the way you communicate, that do see what you stand for on these walls here in the, in, in the studio and in your, your warehouse. And they represent that same value and vision that you have. And I think you standing for these things, even though others may not like it, or maybe offended by it, attracts people that do love it. And that's really cool, is leaning into your identity more and more and more. That's what allows you to expand. 
I wanted to follow up with a question on this because I loved your wisdom and your insights on what you would say to your 33-year-old self. I'm curious if you could go in time to your 53-year-old self and you could reflect back on what you're about to create over these next 10 years because you're about to expand into your vision Mm -hmm. into the world probably even beyond your dreams right now based on what I know you're capable of. Based on what you've done in the last 10 years, it's going to multiply times 10, 100 potentially in the next 10 years. So knowing this is going to happen, knowing the impact, the growth, the service, the success, the, the fulfillment of the customers, the clients, the people you have around you that they have in their lives now, over 10 years, another decade, what advice would you give yourself then to yourself now knowing everything you're about to create? Probably just to keep going. You know what I'm saying? And, and accept the journey for what it is. Mm. And I think, you know, <clears throat> I, I, I think when I think about myself that my purpose here is much bigger than business. Yeah. I think it's much, I think we're going to create a great business. You know, we're going to create an iconic brand. But I don't think that's like my, my like biggest thing what's that I'm your, going to what's do. What's your thing? I think that I was put here to help, and this is going to sound insane, but I believe that I was put here to truly wake people the fuck up mm. so that they can actually understand what freedom truly is. Mm. And I, I believe that I was put here for that mission. I don't think there's anything I can do to stop it. I think that's where my route's going to take me. And I think, I think me building the company and doing all those things is something that will happen as well. But I think probably when I die, people are not going to remember me for that. That's mm. what I think. Mm. And I know that sound that probably sounds egotistical to some people, and shit, but like I have so many of these crazy signs that point me that way. That. And it's such a passionate thing inside of me that burns inside of me because I recognize the manipulation that's happening and I recognize the, the damage that happens because of that. And I recognize the greatness that everybody has inside of them. Mm-hmm. So there's like this mixture of like all these things inside of me where I'm like, hey, you f- guys are being lied to and you're being manipulated and you're being conned into becoming a lesser version of yourself. Yeah. And I think all of these things are going to combine and they're probably going to end up killing me for it. But, but you know, I think that's what I'm here to do. Yeah. You know, that's I can't help it. That's beautiful, man. And I think, uh, for me, I love that you said freedom, giving people the ability to feel free and freedom yeah. in their life is a beautiful mission. Two years ago, I didn't feel free inside. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm a physically free man, right? Well, that's giving, well, are we? Well, I mean, I'm not behind a prison. How much tax do you a, pay? I'm not in a prison. I'm just saying. <laughs> right, right. Like, well, I'm not in a, well, I am in California, so I'll say a lot. But, uh, I mean, bro, we, we live in a highly oppressive environment that is accepted as freedom. And sure. So, and so. Well, let me, yeah, I mean, so, yeah. I mean, I'm not no, behind no, no, bars. I'm, I'm not behind bars. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean, I'm not yeah. a, I'm but, free to do certain things. But I, you're bringing yeah. up a great point because what you're, go ahead, because what you're saying is truly a massive part of freedom. Yeah. For me, it's, it's the inner freedom, right? I mean. Um, you know, I had a brother that went to prison for four and a half years. He was sentenced six to 25. I was eight years old when he went in, uh, and he sold drugs to an undercover cop when he was 19, when he was in college. And back in the nineties, it was the war against drugs, mm-hmm. especially in America. Right. And so first offense, six to 25 years, every weekend for four years, almost every weekend, we would drive two hours to a prison and, and be able to spend a few hours with my brother. And I don't know, there'd be 30, 40 other convicts in the room and their families, right? So every weekend I witnessed what it was like and experienced it, you know, next to him and just the energy of the room is kind of intense, what it feels like to be in a prison. I've never experienced that. Thankfully, I never want to. It's one of the reasons why I never drank, never smoked, never did drugs. Because I was like, I don't even want to be influenced to get to this place Mm -hmm. because I saw the suffering and I saw that it was very painful for a lot of people and their families, people that were impacted by it. However, there were some men there that truly felt free, that looked free, and their energy was free and light. They had done whatever they did to process and mend and heal and forgive and accept 
and they felt free even though they were behind bars. There's a lot of people that you know that are not behind bars and they are in a mental and emotional prison. Absolutely. And that for me is a massive crime. Being physically free, not behind bars. But not being free. But not being free. I don't think that's greatness. Mm. And, and I didn't have freedom in my heart or in my mind fully. There were moments and times, but I still felt like a prisoner of my emotions and my mind until a couple of years ago, until I went on a, a deeper healing journey. And you've, you've heard me talk about being sexually abused when I was a kid and a lot of other things. I started healing a lot of these things, but I realized that I didn't heal enough of it where I fully accepted who I was and forgave myself for everything that I was ashamed of, guilty of, insecure of from my entire past. And I started on the journey. And this journey was this, one of the scariest things I've ever done emotionally a couple of years ago. And by diving into these elements of my past that I was the most ashamed of and starting to create new meaning from those memories, new meaning from the pain, the hurt, the things that I did that I wasn't proud of, things that I did that I was ashamed of and secure of, all this stuff, and created new meaning and started to bring that meaning into my heart and accept it. That's when I started to, the, the pain in my chest that I had off and on for years disintegrated. And it hasn't come back since. And it's been a beautiful feeling to have peace in my heart and to feel freedom. Even though I'm paying taxes no, and all no, these no. other things. There's but levels to, to it. Yes, I there's got levels to it. But to feel free in my mind and my heart and my soul, it, it really is an unbelievable feeling. And it doesn't mean I don't get frustrated and have to deal with stuff from my, you know. Let's dig in on this. Yeah. Because this, this is an important thing that, that, that is very, very important for people to understand, especially those of you who are young, you may not understand this yet, but those of you who are a little bit older and have witnessed some life and done some things, mm -hmm. the idea of forgiving yourself is a confusing idea for people. Okay. And what you just described is the actual process of doing that. Yes. And so many people live with guilt and shame because of the things they were in the past, not realizing that you are no longer that person, yeah. right? Even a year ago, you're, you're not the same person you were a year ago. And when you look back and you feel guilty about all these things that you've done, you should realize that doing those things are is the reason that you now realize that those things are not good to do. They're not right. Yeah. yeah. So they actually served you in a, in a productive way. And furthermore, I, I have this, uh, you know, this thing that I tell people when, because I get asked about forgiveness of self and bro, real talk. I struggle with it too. Yeah. Okay. It's not easy, man. No, it's not. But the one thing that really helped me was, was what you said, assigning a new meeting, understanding mm -hmm. that this happened so that I could get here. And you wouldn't be here without it. Yes. And I, not only would I not be here, if I hadn't learned that lesson, I'd be doing the same thing. Exactly. From here on out. <laughs> exactly. And that's a powerful thing to really give yeah. yourself credit for. Yeah. And then also, you know, you, you know, a lot of people feel guilt and shame over stupid mm -hmm. that is like really stupid. That no one cares about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so like, dude, here's my advice to those of you, okay? There's two elements to this forgiveness and, and probably more. Lewis, you know, you, pr you might have a lot to say about sure. this. But what Lewis just said is extremely powerful. A sign of meaning to these things that you did and understand that you are no longer that person and give yourself the, the freedom to recognize that, okay? And let, let that go. You're, you're not that person. And, and that's another thing cancel culture does, right? Yeah. It makes us afraid of the shit from 10 years ago. Yeah. Well, bro, 10 years ago, I was an idiot. I don't know what to <laughs> right, tell you. Right, right, right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, so, and so were you probably, yeah. okay? So <laughs> let's be real about these bad things that we have mm -hmm. said or done or, or in our lives. And let's understand that they brought us to a point where we now recognize that those things uh, were not good. And now we have wisdom about it. Yes. And we can share that. Exactly. That's right. what allows us to share that with people mm -hmm. on the path. DJ is 27 years old. I get to share a lot of things with him that, yeah. that he wouldn't have heard otherwise. Yeah. Here, here's the thing. There's another way to look at it too. And this really helped me a lot. How would you react if you were sitting in front of you and you, instead of being you, was just a friend of yours, yeah. okay? 
and you're sitting there and you're telling and spouting and venting about all these things you feel guilty about, how would you actually react to it? How you would likely react is you would say, bro, come on, man. Everybody does dumb shit. Right, right, right. Mm-hmm. right? It's all good. Like you did some yeah. dumb shit. Everybody does dumb shit. And then you would say, but it's good you're not doing it. Yeah. Right? And then you would make fun of him and be like, yeah, that's pretty dumb. Right, right. Like, Remember that would, one time? Yeah. yeah. And then you would move the on. Exactly. You know? And so, like, if we could, if we could stop and analyze our <laughs> own guilt and shame mm-hmm. and then address it as you would address it if a friend were yes. confiding in you, I think that's been very helpful for me. Yeah, and I think that's that's the healing journey. It's yeah. it's a it's it's not a destination or a one time thing. It's an ongoing journey of of understanding that I've got to integrate these lessons. I've got to keep mending and growing beyond the old self yeah. that was hurting myself or other people. And the thing that I love about you, what you said a few minutes ago, is that you see the masterpiece in everyone, and so you see their greatness in them even when they don't see it themselves. Mm-hmm. I believe that I look at people the same way. Yeah, you do. I want them i see what's possible and i see where they're at now the vision and how they can get there if they just overcame a few things Mm -hmm. and a lot of it is how we beat up ourselves from the past stuff we did and if we can do what you said which is heal i call it healing but if we can address process i stay away from that term yeah yeah but but it's all good yeah exactly but if we can address it yeah process it in a healthy way yeah and integrate the wisdom for me that's healing if we can do that now it's a fair word yeah, exactly. <laughs> I get it. it yeah. That healing may not be talked no, about in this show, good, bro. but that's how I speak about it. Yeah, because, yeah. because really, I don't think you can have freedom without healing. No, you can't. I don't. So call it what you want, yeah. but I think you got to integrate. I'm just teasing yeah, you. I get yeah. <laughs> and I think if people want to be the masterpiece that they are born to be, if they want to be able to step into that greatness that they are are able to step into, we must at some point mend and create meaning from the past things that hold us back. Mm-hmm. We must come to a place of I'm processing this. I'm no longer going to be defined by these things. I'm going to move into the masterpiece that I'm capable of creating. And that's what the whole process is about. It's about mending, healing, and moving forward into a meaningful mission. Not just about me. How can I fill up me and succeed and win and prove people wrong? It's about how can I fill up all of us around me? How can I fill up we and serve by leaning into my talents and gifts and doing something beyond me. And that's what you've done so beautifully here. It's bigger than you. And it impacts so many people in the world. Thank you, bro. I, I, you know, there's people listening right now and they're like, yeah, but I did this and this and this. Bro, listen, you didn't reinvent the world of f***ing up. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we've all, there, there's plenty of people who have done whatever it is, whatever it is that you, you know, are, are ashamed of or oh, holding man. guilt for. It doesn't matter what it is, bro. Yeah. We all have those things in our past. Every single, if people were truly honest and like you could see people's true lives, uh-huh. like oh, man. everybody would feel a lot better because they'd be like us. <laughs> and here's the thing. The thing Yours that I was pretty bad, bro. Yeah. But that, okay. That's kind of fucked up, but that you little, you messed well, up. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, here's the thing. You know, what's, you know what's, what's crazy is, you know, I, I've talked about this many times that I was sexually abused when I was five years old by a man that I didn't know, right? Not a family member, but a man that I didn't know. And for 25 years, no one knew this about me except for me. It was, I was riddled with shame and insecurity, thinking to myself, if anyone knew this, specifically any men or guy friends of this knew this about me, no one would accept me. No one would love me. Yeah. They would all want to just kick me out of their group and I would have no community and I would be a loser forever. That was the fear that I lived with for 25 years. So I masked a sense of false confidence to try to fit in. But really, I was really deeply wounded and insecure and afraid that if people actually knew what had happened to me, no one would accept me. So it's a huge fear and an insecurity. And here's the crazy thing. One in six men in America have been sexually abused. So you think about all the men in this place. I don't know how many men work here, but it's probably a few hundred. Mm -hmm. There's likely that a a lot of people people here and they've probably never spoken about it. Right. Or maybe that hasn't happened to them, but they were they were manipulated by an abusive father. They were beaten. They were this that whatever, my, or they were abandoned. Whatever it yeah. might be, and, and we're they talking, haven't addressed we're talking it. real, real we're talking made up victimhood. No, no, we're talking about this actually happened. Stuff happened. The shit yeah. we ain't make no I, post about. I, I That's know, right. I <laughs> yes. know you went through a lot of stuff. You yeah. know that you've talked about publicly and privately, and I think. It doesn't mean we have to talk about it all over the social media and say these things of what have happened to us. 
But I feel like we must learn to address it with, with, with ourselves, with a friend, with a coach. I don't care how you address it, but you've got to learn to speak it into existence or write it down so that you can get it out of you. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't poison you. And anymore. sometimes it is appropriate to, if you feel the need to say it on social, that's okay 100%. too. It empowers it's, other here's people. Here's what's not okay. What's yeah, not problem. okay is telling the same fucking story for the next fucking 20 years and using it as an excuse as to why you didn't progress from there on. Right. Now. Yeah. Exactly. That's yeah. what's not okay. What did you do exactly. about it? Yeah, that's so right. Now what? Yeah, exactly. So, anyways, I feel, I feel like, especially with men, and I know you got a lot of men listening and watching. It's like, get the poison out. Whatever yeah. the shame and the thing that you haven't forgiven yourself that you've done or that others have done to you, like find a way to process however you want to, and get it out of you so that you can become a masterpiece. Dude, I hear from so many uh, men specifically who struggle with it, and they're like. Bro, I did these things in the past. I don't know how to forget. Like, I get so many, so many questions from men about not understanding how to forgive themselves. I mean, it's hard, like, man. Yeah, dude. And it's especially it, the soldiers that listen to your show, yes. a lot of former military guys yes. that are part of this community and the things they've had to experience to be in service. But still, they feel like, man, I can't believe I did these things to these people. Yeah. And, it, and I can imagine what that would feel like. Yeah. So well, I dude, didn't mean to cut you off. I think no, you I mean, bro, I'll cut you off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of known for it. It says right up there, let people talk. You know, I can't help it. <laughs> this is a reminder yeah, for we, you. <laughs> so, like, you're the best interviewer on earth, and you and Ed, in my opinion. Um, and then uh, you know, I like to call our full-length episodes conversations. Sure. Because I am a terrible interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> you're great, man. You do a great job listening. Well, I you know I, I notice wor- it. I've worked a lot on it. I know I see it. Yeah, well, and I learned from I learned from watching you. <laughs> You remember that commercial back in the day, dude? Like they, the dad came in with a box of wheat. Yeah, I know you remember, Keith. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dude comes in, finds his kid smoking weed. He's like, where'd you learn this? He's like, I learned it from watching you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. What now were you saying, though? I interrupted you, though. What were you saying? I don't know. About I got the a me- question for you guys. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I mean, talking about the struggle, things that, you know, you, you, you're, you know, I guess not happy that you've done in the past, mm-hmm. things like that. Would you guys say a healthy way of kind of dealing with that is just like one thing for me personally, I've had a lot of I've, you know hardship struggles, right? But I've always in the back of my mind had a mentality like, I mean, I know there's somebody else out there that had it worse. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's not that bad. But that's discounting it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's Yes. Okay. Someone's always yeah. going to be worse than you. Yeah. There's going to be people doing horrible things or having worse things done to them than you or, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. 100%. But that's, that's discounting still the things that you've gone you're through. Not, you're you're not validating that this is a real thing that's bothering you. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. And I used to do that for a long time. For 25 years, almost every day, I would have this movie in my mind of me being sexually abused that was happening, right? It was kind of like my mind was replaying it over and over again. It's traumatizing to like experience it in your mind almost constantly. It's why I couldn't sleep at night. It was just like, it's exhausting. And I kept trying to discount it and say, oh, it's not that big a deal. Like, and my little brain developing over years, I was just like, uh, whatever. It's not a big deal. Don't be a don't be a wuss just step up just like get stronger who cares like Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter and again that darkness drove me to get results in sports and so it worked in terms of success but it left me feeling very alone and and unfulfilled so it didn't work in terms of spiritual success it won't work in practicality either right and here here's the thing i meant to say this earlier but i but i missed it but it doesn't practically work either to drive. You cannot be driven by the dark side all the time. And that's coming from me, someone who <laughs> preaches the usefulness yeah, of, course, of it. Because it is useful at it, times. Very useful. And, and you are going to have to use it no matter what phase you are in at certain times. The key is knowing when it's appropriate to use it and knowing that it shouldn't be all consuming yes, and burn you to the ground. Exactly. And that's something that I think since I've met you, I think that's the most profound improvement I've made mm, mm. personally. Um, that's what I'm most proud of. That's great, man. So, but practically speaking, that dark side will drive you. And I'm, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but this is an important point. The direct, the dark side will drive you to a certain point of success. And that point of success is in the seven, eight figure range. I mean, you can mm-hmm. do very well with that. hundred percent. Okay. However, when you want to expand past that, you have to come to the realization that it's not about you and right. it's about serving. It is. It's about providing uh, some sort of value, however you see, to the people around you, to your customers, everything. 
And what you'll realize is that when you become purpose driven, you actually make a whole lot more fucking money. Hundred percent. So it's a it's a pr there's practicality to what you're saying. Yeah. It's not just hey. Uh, the dark side's not good. No, it is good sometimes. Sometimes that's all you got. Sometimes, guess what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to shove it down your throat. That is very practical when you're in the beginning phases, Yes, I believe. But once it gets you, you off the ground. Yes. Yeah. And dude, and I don't think you should ignore it. I think you should use it. I no. think you should recognize that these people are being, and you're going to shove it down their throats. And that will get you off the ground and get you to a good place. But it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. And it, there is a ceiling to it. Yeah. There's a ceiling to it because you have to, you have to come to the understanding that that's not what actually makes empires or fortunes or true wealth. That will make you a decent income. Mm. What actually makes you wealthy is a combination of your purpose the value you provide, mm -hmm. the money that you make from providing that purpose, but also the fulfillment that you feel by actually delivering value to other human beings. Yeah. That's wealth. The belief's there now. And I, also yeah. think, and I also think wealth is having beautiful relationships in your life. For sure. That people that care about you, that are there for you. You can't do that when you're burning the world down. Nah, man. You can only do that when you become purpose-driven. Because you become resentful, you become a yeah. win-lose mentality. Yes. And you're gonna hurt the people closest to you. You're gonna push them away. You're gonna yeah. have to find new friends always. And it's exhausting. It's a balance, bro. Yeah. It's, it's knowing, truly it is. It's knowing where it's appropriate to use yeah. and where it's not. Yeah. But ultimately, Ultimately, if you want to save 10 years, <laughs> real talk, 10 years of being off, just understand right now that the reason that you're in business, the reason you do what you do is to serve your customers mm -hmm. and to serve your employees. If you could realize that that is actual mm -hmm. truth right now, you are much further ahead. And I think, DJ, to follow up with what you're saying, there's a lot of men out there who are really good men, but they don't do that the extra little courageous work that it takes to become great men and i'm not speaking about this with you but it, it's just like if men have the thing of you know well i had it rough or this was tough mm -hmm. but it wasn't as bad as my buddy or this person or this person i see on the news you discount it and you still don't address the things that are holding you back whatever that is your shame your insecurity your guilt your flaws if you don't address it it's going to keep you at good but it's not going to make you great and i think that's the the switch that's like the the next level unlock mm -hmm. that supports you from expanding your ability to experience all the stuff you want in life that you love, a rich life. If it's more love, if it's more intimacy, if it's more wealth, if it's better health, whatever it is, that's that extra unlock that takes it to the next level in my mind. And that's what I get worried about is men who stay good and don't become great by doing that extra little work. I think, I think, it, I think that's a very great point bro because well society tells us otherwise well <laughs> what do you mean like society tells us that as as men like it's okay like you know we don't have to talk about our feelings we you know we we, we can yeah just... but see dude i also believe that society has overcorrected to the point where people mm -hmm. are just gushing out all their yeah. bullshit right. too much victimhood right. yeah and it's like bro come on man that's what i'm saying like, like i'm addressing it bro i was fucking broke as a kid i get it yeah <laughs> you know yeah, what i'm saying yeah, like yeah. but there's there's a <laughs> There's a balance there. Yes. And there's a there's a line there's a to time walk. and a place and there's yes. a balance. And, and, yeah. and what we've seen over the last five or six years, in my opinion, is we've seen a culture of victimhood uh overtake because you know it's it being sounds, celebrated. It's being celebrated. Yes, bro. That's and the it challenge. sounds good. It sounds good to like accept yourself and love yourself. And it doesn't matter that you're 450 pounds and that you eat <laughs> shit every day. Mm -hmm. You should still love yourself. And it's beautiful. And it's beautiful. this, bro, like there's been this, this societal shift to where, you know, it's almost the opposite of the way it was. What you're describing is the way that it was, mm -hmm. but I'm tough. I'm, I'm overly, you were a whole book about this. Mm -hmm. We all got to deal yeah. with it. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, man up right, right yeah. and there, there's there's a time for that okay like if you're in the heat of battle bro and you just don't have time to deal you with the, you right the second <laughs> yeah and we've corrected over to this point now where people have made their identity victimhood and they talk about their thing their their you know their whatever it is the, mm -hmm. the traumatic thing your upbringing yeah your your se the sexual misconduct mm -hmm. these things these things become our identity mm -hmm. okay and when they become our identity 
and we talk about them all the time, what actually happens is we create a prison for ourselves to live yeah. in as victims. Yes. And that's why I'm mm. so anti that culture. Yeah. I it's, understand yeah. there's a place for vulnerability and there's a place for, and, there, and it's real and you need to have it. There, there's a place for addressing the issues internally, but there's also a place for saying, well, that doesn't make me who the I am. Yeah. That's something that some did to me 25 years yeah. ago. And you know what? It sucks. I learned this. This is what it did for me. And now I'm going to leave it over here. And I'm going to continue to move forward. Yeah. And I think to, to add to what you're saying is like, yes, you can accept and love yourself, but that doesn't mean you get to be lazy. It's like, yeah. how can I be even more disciplined in my mission moving forward and make the masterpiece come out of me? Bro, it's, not, it's not saying I'm, I accept myself, I forgive myself, and now I'm good to just be lazy. Unless that, that brings you fulfillment, but a lot of us get fulfillment from the discipline, from using our gifts and talents and adding values to others. Yeah. That's why the meaningful mission for me is so important to have, and I think every man and anyone should have a meaningful mission. For me, I, I know what it is in one sentence, and then I make decisions daily based on that one sentence mission for my life in this season of my life. I know you guys are very clear on your mission and allows you to be disciplined because there's, if there's a meaningful mission, it requires you to become something you aren't yet. You have to be disciplined to get there. It's not going to happen by being lazy. Right. And that's why I think we need to be clear on what that meaningful mission is for us. Well, and I think we also have to be conscious that our point is we, we have to be very careful to not make these bad things that happen to us our identity. Yes. Right? Like I got stabbed in the face, bro. Like, like here, here here and i got once in the back too okay it was could have been very easy for me as a 23 year old man who worked retail who had to deal with people face to face to make that my entire identity and say that's the whole reason i couldn't make it because people had to look at my face and then when they looked at my face it scared them or it made them uncomfortable which it did it was swollen the size of a grapefruit for a year bro uh -huh. people would either look at the floor or look like look around or they would look right at your face and they say, bro, what happened to your face? <laughs> so you're dealing with this all the time. It would have been easy for me to say, man, I can't do business now because this happened to me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But instead, and I was lucky because I had an incredible, uh, angel kind of bring me this message. Uh, you know, the, the, this woman who I met in the grocery store had been burned over 90% of her body Wow. and, uh, her whole family had died in a plane crash. And the first, like, dude, her face was like melted off. Really? And, yeah. And we, we, you met her in a store. Yeah, bro. So like I, you know, I went through a bad, uh, a bad time, like where I was very suicidal for real. Yeah. Like I had thought about how I was going to do it. It was basically just a matter of when I was going to wow. And, uh, you know, you got to remember, bro, I was 23 years old. Like I'm, yeah. I was a decent looking dude. I'm like, you know, no, I'm like, I'm, Easy man. I'm never going to meet any girls. You know what I'm saying? Like it was a bad, it was a lot to deal with. And you know, I didn't have the maturity or understanding to know, like, actually, bro, it's not that big of a deal. Right. Um, but I was walking down the, gro the, the, the aisle of grocery store and this woman, we bumped carts at the end and I would have my head down and I looked up and she was standing there and I couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman because she was wearing like a raincoat and a rain hat and bro, her face was completely gone. Like, Melted. Completely gone. Like, you know, like no nose or anything. Really? And she looks at me, bro. And she looks me right in the eye. She goes, what happened to your face? No way. Yeah, like as a joke. Like, because she knew, because at that time I had a big swelling going on. She knew what I was going through. And uh, we had like a 15 minute conversation. And then I left. I never saw her again, never heard from her again or never anything. Like, I, I, I don't know if that was like a real person or if it was an angel or what happened but whatever it was it set me on a different trajectory really yeah and the trajectory that i went on from that point forward was how can this serve me mm. how can this serve me Damn. and the the immediate thing that i found that it served me was well nobody remembers you because you guys are so insignificant now people definitely remember you you know like hey who's uh who you know those guys over at supplement superstores and they're like no nah, who's that you, you know andy the guy with the with the scars it may, it, that, that, as silly as that sounds, it was an advantage that other people didn't have. Right. So I was able to find meaning in that. And like, instead of me going down the road of like, I could have went one of two ways. I could have went the way I went and ended up here and continue to go. Or I could have been the person that said, this doesn't happen to anybody else. Nobody else has been stabbed in the face. Right. 
everybody else, you know, I could have made that story and I could have just quit. Yeah. And that's, that's the problem with the victim culture that we have. Anything that you're going through, anything that you've been through, these things have positive and meaningful purpose if you choose to examine them. And sometimes it's really hard, right? Like sometimes it's a family member dying. Yeah. Sometimes it's something that you have a really hard time understanding what good could possibly come from this. But if you look hard enough and you think hard enough and you give yourself enough openness to consider the realm of possibilities, there's always a way to serve that comes from these things. hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. And I found that to be true, man. That's a beautiful The most story, impactful man. people that I've ever met in my life, brother, are people who have been through the worst. The worst. The worst. You know, Jason Redman? Uh, I know who he story? is. Yeah. I haven't met him. But I, I admire him. I know his story, afar. man. Yeah, almost got yeah. his like face blown off yeah. and came back, and it's unbelievable the amount of peace he has, yeah, and the amount of joy because what he thought was like the end of his life or the end of his purpose became his purpose, mm -hmm. right? And he leaned into how mm -hmm. can I actually teach and serve from this place, not from a victim mentality, but this happened to me. It's unfortunate. I almost lost my whole face. Yeah, reconstructed it, uh, and I think he got a shot a few other times and. He created a sign in the uh, in his hospital room that essentially kind of made it. It went viral. It was like, if you enter this room, you must be positive, a hundred percent positive, and have zero pity for me. It says something like this, yeah, right? Yeah. And um, he was just like, I'm not going to be taking any pity from from being a victim, saying it's going to hold me back from living my life, mm -hmm. building relationships with my family, being of service, and it's catapulted him because he's owned it. Right, he owned what happened to him. He said, "I'm going to go out there and make a big impact." And it's a beautiful thing when someone owns the the traumas or the tragedies that happen and they serve. Yeah, bro. J By the way, Jason, if you hear this, I would love to have you on the show. Oh, you got to have him. Yeah, he's great. He's, he's friends on, with yeah. a lot of my friends. I yep. just never met him in person. Yeah, he's great. Um, bro, I'm super excited for your book to get out there. Um, thanks, man. When does it When does it actually March, come? March seventh drops. Okay, this is what it looks like for you guys on YouTube. We're doing YouTube now. I love it, man. Yeah, we just, we just started. <laughs> oh, man, you should have done that years ago. I know, bro. Dude, well, I think just you wait. told me that. And I just didn't. wait. It's going to blow up for you. It's going to blow up, man. Yeah. I, uh, it's been cool so far. You know, it's still pretty slow. We're getting, uh, we're getting shadow banned on YouTube for the cursing. <laughs> so, like, they have green, yellow, and red, apparently, yeah. and I'm in the yellow. So, it's, you know. <laughs> Which is, yeah. like, I thought we were going to worry about that. I'm surprised I'm not in the red. But there, but these guys are working on getting that taken care of. YouTube promised yeah. me that if I if I uh, uploaded full episodes, that they would make sure that didn't happen. That's so we're great. working on getting that taken care of. But That's it's awesome. been cool. I think it's given people different ask, uh, different. Um, like I think it's different for people when they just listen mm -hmm. versus when they watch. Yeah, man. And you're gonna get a whole new audience. Yeah. we've got almost like almost I mean two point six two point seven million subscribers on our main channel. Yeah, on YouTube. On YouTube. Yeah, that's and awesome. We got a hundred million views last year on the main channel. Yeah. And we dub in Spanish, yeah, uh, and we got 50 awesome. million views on our Spanish channel. Yeah, you're killing it. So man. you're going to be able to really impact more lives because people are going to discover you on YouTube more. Yeah. And uh, it's just going to expand your reach. You know what I found, too, also on YouTube, which I think is really cool, and a shout out to everybody that watched on YouTube, is that the comments that people make it's, it's, are much more real comments. Yeah, it's like good. It, it's not trolling. It's yeah. like they actually give it. Mm -hmm. And I thought I think the culture on YouTube <clears throat> is better. It is. Um, you know, Instagram is so trolly. Mm -hmm. It's just like so many bots and yeah, trolls. Dude, and yeah, that. dude. It's just like they need to clean it up. Yeah. Um, but anyhow, uh, this is the book. And I think you guys, I got to skim through it for about 15 minutes before um we started the show. I haven't read it yet. Mm -hmm. I am going to read it. It's gonna be my next book. I read on 75 hard. Uh, but the main thing that I want to make you guys understand is that Lewis understands what the fuck is going on. Okay, he's interviewed very well some of the greatest minds that are alive right now. I mean, dude, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds mm -hmm. of them. And I'm not saying thousands because I'm sure there were some duds along the way. Right, right. <laughs> but the reality was <laughs> this dude understands and he's done a lot of great things in, in, uh, in his life. And I hope you guys support him by buying his book. Um, and bro, I appreciate you coming on and sharing today. Thanks, man. brother. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, it's really good to see you too. It's good to see you, brother. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a couple of years. Missed you, man. Yeah, I'm likewise, gonna give you a bro. bigger bear hug when we leave yeah, too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. So, brother. anything you want to leave him with? I just love that you are a big believer that every human being is a masterpiece waiting to come out, 
And I would leave people with that. You know, if there's something you feel like you haven't done yet or you haven't said yet or you haven't stepped up into yet, whether inside of you or outside of you, now's the time. I think your show is an amazing platform for people to find meaning and create consistent discipline in their life. Um, yeah, I just love seeing everyone who's doing 75 hard constantly. I still haven't done it fully myself. You know, I got to get the courage to complete that thing fully, but I love seeing other people transform their mind and their discipline from that. I'm a pretty disciplined guy in other yeah. ways, but I love seeing that being a catalyst for so many. And uh, I would just encourage people to keep listening to you, watching you. If you're new to YouTube, make sure you subscribe uh, and share this out because I love this conversation. So lean into your masterpiece and be disciplined and consistent along the way. Yeah, keep it real. <laughs> Bro, I love you, man. Love you too, man. Yeah, Thanks, I appreciate brother. you appreciate coming on Andy. the show. If you are ready to unlock the power of your mind and live your best life today, and you want the tools and strategies to do that, then make sure to click this box right over here to get a new copy of my book, The Greatness Mindset. It's out right now. Again, click this box right here to get a copy of my book.